and our alumnus of the year, please welcome Mr. Edward Snowden. Great, thank you. I apologize for that. There was actually so much, uh, so much applause there that it, it cut the audio. <laughs> really, thank you, thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's something that I'm not used to in, in a number of uh, number of different political settings. I think, uh, think students for liberty is different. Um, when we think about libertarianism and we think about the political status quo in the United States and around the world. There's a lot of tribalism. There's a lot of us versus them. There's a lot of you know red team and blue team, and that's not really healthy. Uh, when we think about democracy, when we think about the way things fit together, we think about the way we interact, the way we, we control our relationship with the government as a civil society. We have to have an even playing field, and we have to ultimately, at the end of the day, think not about what divides us, but what holds us together. And the basis of libertarianism is the basis of thinking about personal choice, about individual worth, about the right to decide how we want to live, who we want to be, and how we voluntarily interact with one another. And no matter how you feel about you know, this particular program or this particular controversy on, on the Republican side of the fence, the Democratic side of the field, ultimately, as long as we can agree that we have basic rights, we have shared values, and that we have common goals that every American seeks to work together to realize, such as the belief that the pursuit of liberty, of a more perfect union, of a cooperative project, to realize the value of individual and collective rights, not just at home, but around the world, in a voluntary and cooperative basis, as opposed to a conflict-driven and authoritarian model, uh, we can really make progress toward a future that is radically different, not just from what we see today, but from what we've seen in the past. There's been a lot of criticism about uh, me in particular. Uh, you know, there's been sort of this debate here of traitor and all this stuff, and that's really irrelevant, because when we look at issues that really matter for everybody in this room, for everybody outside of this room, it doesn't matter whether I'm a good guy or a bad guy. I could be the worst person on earth, but what really matters to you are the policies and programs of your government that are done in your name, and the powers that they apply against you and for you. And if we, as a, as a, as a democratic uh, society, as a republic, can't understand at least the broad outlines, if not every detail, of the way our programs uh, and our policies as they relate to intelligence and surveillance and the control of individuals in society are applied, how can we vote? How can we say that the government is, you know, uh, our, our political model is founded on the consent of the government if our consent is not informed? There's, there, there are many challenges uh, when, when we look at things, and, and particularly uh, sort of this, this surveillance model that we see developing today. But the, the basic principles are that Ultimately, decisions that affect the lives of everybody in the country, of every man, woman, and child, decisions about the boundaries of the rights individuals enjoy can't be made behind closed doors. These are necessarily public decisions. These are necessarily individual decisions. These are conversations that we have to have within our homes, within our schools, at our places of work, at our places of worship, and then together, collectively, as a society, we direct the government as to how to decide these issues. 
And if we don't know about what's going on, and they're making these decisions without us, if they take away our seat at the table of government, can we really be, be said to, to be a, a, a society that's founded on the idea of liberty, of equality, of justice and fairness? More importantly, we have a system of checks and balances in this, this country that uh, back in 2013 was being severely eroded, not just through sort of these, these, these secret courts and these secret programs and these, uh, these decisions that were being made without any sort of public involvement, public oversight. Even the majority of members of Congress had no idea that these programs existed. Yes, there were intelligence uh, committees in the Senate and the House, but those are only a few individuals out of our, our many representatives. Yeah. We also saw that the courts themselves were rejecting uh, their ability, and not just their, their ability, but their responsibility to evaluate the lawfulness and constitutionality of these programs. In 2013, the, the U.S. Supreme Court knew, uh, you know, the, these cases and controversies were brought before them, saying something bad is happening. You know, mass surveillance is, is likely to occur. The government argued that, hey, you know, it might be happening. We won't say one way or another. Uh, but if it were, you guys can't debate this. You, you can't decide on the legality of this because it's a safe secret. The Supreme Court no longer has a role to play in checks and balances of society. That was 2013. In the wake of this, we've moved to a model where we're seeing courts in the United States ruling again, as was said earlier. You know, some of these programs are likely overwhelming, but also in our allies. It's the seed of liberty that's beginning to burst forth around the world, where even in the United Kingdom, they find these programs of mass surveillance had been occurring for years and years and years, and they were unlawful. They were unlawful even by, by the courts, the secret courts, the intelligence uh, or the investigatory powers for people in the UK, which is equivalent to sort of rubber stamp surveillance oversight court in the United States that had every incentive, because they're not normal courts, they're not open courts, they exist to basically sign off on these prerogatives of state programs. Uh, they said that these programs were not lawful. But when we know about these things, when we, the people, have sort of a, a role to play, when we debate these uh, programs and their values, their efficacy, uh, for example, you know, we know in the United States now they've been collecting all of our phone records for years and years and years, uh, since the Stellarwind program that was the Bush era. Uh, we've got the Section 215 program that continues now today with the current president. Uh, we have the, the 702 collection and uh, the, the upstream and the prison program that uh, is applied by the, the corporate uh, corporation that you see on the top of the slide. Uh, all of these programs happen collectively. And what they mean is the government is collecting private records. They have access to the private interactions of every citizen, almost everywhere. Now they say, well, we don't actually look at these records uh, in every but we do intercept them, we do parse through them, we do sort of analyze them. But the Fourth Amendment in our country forbids not just the unreasonable search of our personal effects, but also the seizure of them in the first place. And if they take the private records of all of our lives and they aggregate sort of a, a dossier on the activities of every citizen in this country, uh, how can that be said to be, to be constitutional? How can that be said to be uh, valuable, even if it is constitutional, which is very much in question today, when we look at its track record, uh, two panels in the United States appointed by this president, um, both the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board called the Eighth Law, uh, as well as the, the president's review group on uh, communications technology, reviewed these programs and found they had never once stopped a single imminent terrorist attack. Why have we been allowing the collection and funding uh, to, to the detriment of many other uh, national interests? Why have we been funding and instituting a system of mass surveillance that affects everyone in this country and people around the world if there's no track record that says it even works in the first place, regardless of questions of lawfulness? Why are we doing this? And how can we change it? This was a question that prior to 2013 was never discussed. Now it is being discussed and things are changing.
So I, I would say uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of controversies and criticisms that are there. You know, uh, there are always going to be questions about was this story that this journalist published uh, in the public interest was it the right call? I think many of the people in this room uh, take a a much more uh, much more pro liberty pro rights perspective than many others in the U.S. sort of political arena. But ultimately. Uh, it is fair to say I don't agree or I don't or I disagree with this, that, and the other. But when we talk about surveillance, we need to remember that we're not just talking about surveillance. We're talking about democracy and we're talking about control. Because at the end of the day, surveillance is a mechanism of control. When we have systems of state surveillance that monitor uh, a public uh, or a body of people, as opposed to individually targeting uh, suspects of serious crimes, they, we've gone to a court and shown that there is some reasonable suspicion uh, that under uh, that underlies sort of our our, our uh, desire to monitor these people, but instead do it uh, overall. We're fundamentally changing the relationship between the government and those who are governed by it, and this is this is a, a critically dangerous thing. Now, others might argue that this is a good thing, and. It, you know, if we take away the political philosophy uh, and we actually try to suspend libertarian thinking for a minute, and I know this is very difficult. <laughs> uh, and we say, well, what if, what if we did surveil everybody in society? What if we compiled a perfect record of every individual's activities and looked through it? What if we stopped all law breaking everywhere? What if we made sure that our laws were perfectly enforced? There's an argument to be made that perfect enforcement of the law is not a good thing. In fact, it's a very serious threat to the progress of society and the progress of liberty, sort of our pursuit of, of the kind of life and the kind of society that we want to enjoy and to give to our descendants. Because think about this. If we were able to perfectly enforce the laws, every unlawful action in the history of this nation that has made this country great would not have been possible. The American Revolution would not have been possible. The Civil Rights Movement would not have been possible. Uh, we would even say reform of drug laws would not be possible. You couldn't even speak on the, on the motorways, right? And at the end of the day, we have to simply look at these, these, these questions of how do we draw the balance between individual activity and state? We don't necessarily want a state that is entirely ineffective. Uh, you know, they, they do have some benefits for society that really don't need to be test outside of on philosophical grounds. Uh, and there are there are really arguments to be made that, that you know we want to be philosophically pure. We want to minimize the role of government. But when we look at the, the the final balance of these issues, it comes down to the idea that legality is not the same as morality. And law is a lot like medicine. You know, uh, in a small measure, uh, it comes down to dosing. When you have just enough of it, it's helpful. But when you have too much, it can be fatal. Or it can be fatal. Uh, I call it. Uh, and with that, let me, let me end my comments and, and, and turn it over for questions, because nobody wants to hear me thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm incredibly honored to be recognized. by giving you what I think is a softball question, but what person do you admire most in the world today, and why? That's actually, you know, I, I wouldn't say that's a, that's a softball question. You can't answer that without, uh, without disappointing, you know, the other 99.99999% of people in the world um, for any question, but I think this is a... Uh, 
a good illustration of something that people have put on me, which is, you know, uh, do you consider yourself a hero? Um, and I don't. The same reason I don't name a particular individual when I'm asked who do I admire the most is because we should never admire individuals for who they are. We should admire them for their actions. Ultimately, you know, there are no heroes, there are only heroic acts. The same way, you know, there are no admirable people so much as there are admirable activities. Because if we start to say, and you know, this is a philosophical point, if we start to say, yes, well, of course, you know, if there are admirable acts, that makes the person admirable. If there are uh, heroic actions, that makes the person a hero. And you know, in a tautological sense, that's true. However, in a deeply uh, civic sense, in a, um, in a sort of psychological sense, we should resist this to an extent. Because when we say this person is a hero, this person is who I admire more than anyone else in the world, we are otherizing them. We are distancing them, them from ourselves and saying, you know, oh, gosh, I wish I could be like that person. Uh, I wish I could do what they did. Uh, you know, I wish I could, I, could, I, could, I, I, I could be like them, but I'm not. I could never do what they do. They're a hero. They're in, you know, this, they're this incredible person. They're the president, the leader of this organization. And ultimately, they are no different from us. I mean, there are so many people, journalists, activists, leaders, technologists, who I look at every day, and I, I can't look at their work without feeling a tremendous level of envy and inadequacy, because I go, oh, how, how little I've done. But it's not about matching someone else. It's about recognizing that that spark of, of industry in them that inspires us to emulate them. And to realize that the distance between uh, you know, this person and ourselves is, is only related to, to effort and circumstance. And while circumstances uh, you know, may be invariable to a certain extent, effort is entirely variable. It's up to us, and it's it's really controlled by the values uh, that we hold and the principles that we pursue. So rather than naming an individual, I would say that everyone who has seen any tiny measure of wrongdoing in their lives and stood up against it and said, look, yes, you know, I, I realize there is some consequence to this, but it's not right. Even if I can't do something about it, it's not right. And I want to change it. And tried to change it. And made some, some, some tiny effort to be a part of that change. That's the person I admire. And what's special about this conference is that's who's sitting in the room. If you are here, it's because you care about this issue. It's because you care about our rights and you care about our liberty. And you're trying to make it better. Now, as a follow-up, I'd like to ask, given 2020 hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently if you had the chance? I and if so, what? Um, when I look at this, I actually had a conversation with Daniel Ellsberg, who is the whistleblower from the Pentagon, who is about the Vietnam. Uh, and he is very convinced that revealing the information he did shortened the war and saved lives. However, he, like myself, couldn't get over sort of these psychological burden, the fear of law breaking. Uh, because, you know, we, we all are, are raised to have respect for the law, and this is important as a, as a social value. But we, we all have sort of an internal sense, an innate sense, of when lawfulness has really divorced itself from right and wrong. And I was talking to people about these programs at the NSA. Uh, I, I was speaking with my coworkers and, and showing them these programs of, of mass surveillance, showing that we had collected more sort of uh, communications events in the United States uh, about you know, US persons and things like that, communications going through US systems, than we had on Russians, for example, and that didn't seem right. You know, who are our adversaries? Who should we be focusing on? Should we really be scrutinizing ourselves 
more than we should be focusing on, you know, typical adversary behavior. Uh, and they, you know, my, my, my colleagues and my coworkers, they agreed. They were like, yeah, this is wrong, but, you know, don't, uh, don't put this in writing. Uh, don't tell anybody about this because you know what happens to people do. I really should have disregarded that because the longer that I wait and the longer that everybody stays silent when they, they see wrongdoing, the more systematized it becomes and the more entrenched these authorities uh, become. And once the government spends money on something, once uh, they've invested in sort of sunk costs, and once sort of spy chiefs, uh, state security organizations, have become accustomed to a certain level of privilege and authority and power relative to sort of a private citizen, it's very difficult to claw back the rights that we've lost. And I am concerned that uh, we would be in a better place had I come forward sooner. Uh, however, we are still making progress, and I am still hopeful because ultimately, what 2013 and the intervening period has shown us was that if the government will not be responsible stewards of our digital lives, uh, we, through technology, can encode our rights into our system through into our systems and technologies through you know encryption, anonymous routing technology, mixed nets, um, uh, sort of high latency networking, things like this. And it gets kind of technical, but the uh, the idea is that we can enforce our well, or our rights through something other than sort of letters on the page. And again, if they're not you know going to be the trustworthy partners in sort of the political process. We, for the very first time, I think in a very long time in sort of human history, have the ability to claw back a domain of sort of communications of our private lives uh, and say, look, we're going to remove your ability to regulate this practice entirely unless you can play fair. And this, you see through sort of the FBI director uh, denouncing the, the use of encryption on the new iPhone, and you know they're acting terrified and wringing their hands, saying, oh, we're going to go dark. You know, uh, Law enforcement's not going to work anymore. We're not going to be able to investigate anybody. At the same time that during the Silk Road trial in uh, online drug market, uh, sort of an alleged mastermind, uh, who was using uh, a number of encrypted technologies, uh, PGP encryption, uh, which we know from the NSA's documents, they, they claim they couldn't break. Uh, Tor, which is a very robust anonymizing technology, uh, they were reading his private encrypted diaries in a courtroom. At the same time, the FBI director saying, "Oh, encryption is going to stop law enforcement entirely." <laughs> they are afraid of the political actions we take that can reduce their power relative to the body and citizens. And this is something that is somewhat radical, and, and we don't want to uh, we don't want to pursue it recklessly. But we should remember that we have more power now than we realize. And yes, you know there are uh, there are extraordinary powers being claimed by governments, but we have the ability to escalate this power, and they need to engage us. And I think, uh, I trust that they will engage us because ultimately that is the only way they will be able to continue uh, to participate in society the way they, they've always uh, desired to do so. And they are afraid of losing powers entirely more so than they are worried about losing them to it. I know you're quite busy and have to leave us in a minute, but do you have any final words that you'd like to share with this audience in particular? Rather than that, because uh, you know people are going to get a lot of speeches over the weekend, why don't, why don't we take one more question, just uh, just so people can actually get what they want to hear, rather than what I have to say. Sounds good. Then, as last question. In the documentary Citizen Four, you express worry that by outing yourself as the NSA leaker, the media would get distracted and focus more on you than the information you revealed. And perhaps there's some irony in us having you speak and receive an award for this very same idea. But do you think this has come true? And what are your thoughts on that now? I think it is, uh, it is true that the media immediately jumped on that. I mean, if you go back and look at the footage, uh, as soon as they had a name and a face, uh, 
they they went all over a wall-to-wall -wall coverage. I mean, they were they were finding images of my romantic partner, her blog, putting them all over there. Uh, things that had really no public interest whatsoever. But it was much more comfortable to think about these individuals and what they're doing and salacious details of their lives, rather than the hard questions about what are we going to do about a government that is radically redefining the kind of rights that we as a society enjoy. Um, what is incredible is despite that sort of full court press uh, in, in, uh, in the reporting arena, despite the incredible character smears that came out of uh, the officials who were sort of most uh, embarrassed by these disclosures, people are still talking about this now in 2015. I mean, when I was in the hotel room in Hong Kong uh, speaking with the journalists, we were all pretty, uh, pretty certain that even though these are uh, these were clearly very important, they were kind of abstract. They were difficult to grasp. You know, who really understands the idea of privacy? Who understands the workings of the internet and how this works on an average level? You know, people in this room who are very politically aware, uh, who are engaged, who are young, who are technologically active, connected. Yeah, we get this stuff innately. However, uh, for the grandmother in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, she, she changes the channel. We assumed this would in many ways be a three-day story. The fact that the United Nations has said mass surveillance is a violation of human rights. The UK, which has some of the worst policies in the world on surveillance, uh, their own sort of rubber stamp court, which has existed for 15 years and never once ruled against the intelligence uh, the surveillance agencies, ruled for the very first time, just days ago, that the GCHQ, their NSA equivalent, had been violating the rights of British citizens for more than seven years. This is incredible. Uh, and this is, a, this is a reason for hope. And in the United States, you know, we have our ups and downs. We had uh, an extraordinarily, uh, I, I think, almost unprecedented decision in the Jewel v. NSA case brought by the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, where a whistleblower long before myself, uh, an engineer working, I believe, at AT&T, uh, said, hey, the NSA has a secret room in this uh, telecommunications provider's facility where they're making copies of everybody's data uh, that's transiting the lines. And this seems like it might break a couple laws. It's been pending litigation for years and years and years. Now the case is still limping forward. It's been held up by state secrets privileges uh, for years. Prior to 2013, it looked like it was going to be dismissed entirely. Um, a few days ago, they said the government can't litigate. The, uh, the judge ruled that they would not allow the internet surveillance side of the case to move forward. Because even though it was very likely that the government had, in fact, uh, surveilled the plaintiffs, and very likely had violated the rights, um, any defense that the government could provide uh, in court would have uh, forced the disclosure of what they call the state secrets. I, I forget the exact quote there. But this is extraordinary. The court said, that because the government could not defend itself, defend its unlawful programs, um, without revealing state secrets, we have no ability to contest the programs at all. And this is something that you know is profoundly negative, but we still have many more uh, appeals pending, and moreover, we have the political process. Ultimately, there's a ton of people in government that have extraordinary budgets. Uh, you know, the intelligence budget in the United States is $75 billion a year if you count military intelligence uh, programs in that as well. That's not going to science. That's not going to education. It's not going to health care. It's not going to infrastructure. But it's not going to anything that really benefits us other than if we're trying to sort of run every country in the world. Uh, but $75 billion is a drop in the bucket compared to the gross national product of this country. When we think about the combined output of everybody in this room, of everybody in this state, of everybody uh, you know, around us, everybody in our combined community, not just nationally, but internationally, who believes in our rights, who believes in our values, there are more of us than them. And no matter what they do, we can do.
Bailey, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. It's been a lot to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you and have a good week.